if the commercial realm's not working for you, well, hey, a couple of duplexes and quads can add up pretty quickly, you know, there's to, to a small multi-unit. And, and you're not stuck in that commercial wheel of financing, which is a disaster right now. The residential realm still has some garbage around. What's going on, everybody? I'm Chris Noggle, and welcome back to the Money School Podcast, where we talk about, you guessed it, money, but we're also, we love talking about real estate because real estate is single-handedly the greatest investment you can ever put money into, and there's so many benefits to it. So we're going to wrap money in real estate and journeys into today's episode. I've got a, a legend in the industry, Jim Shields. He's got a book that you all need to check out called Family Board Meeting. Especially any of you that have families, you must read this book. It can be bought or found on any of the normal channels you'd buy a book. But let's just talk a little bit about Jim. 22 years of experience, 2,000 acquisitions, actually more than that. This is old data. Over 300 million in deals. But the best part, he was one of the pioneers in the build to rent model. And if you don't know what that is, it's building a house for the purpose of renting instead of selling. No more of the fix and flip or new builds. This is the build to rent model, which has become so popular. And I think that's what we're really gonna hone in today is we're gonna talk about the relevance of that, what the future is for real estate. A lot of people are struggling a little bit right now because the Fed decided to go on a, a sling of the inflation that they created, but we won't go there. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Good to be here. Absolutely, man. Well, hey, just tell me a little bit about your background. Like, you know, how did you get into real estate? What what happened before that? And and don't leave out any of the falling on your face episodes. Oh, yeah, there are plenty of those. That could be a whole episode. <laughs> so I started in in real estate. Now it's been 24 years ago. I, I was looking for some sort of entrepreneurial avenue to go into. And I loved the stat that seven out of 10 millionaires at the time, it's even grown higher now. Seven out of 10 millionaires in the US made their money in real estate. And I grew up in North Jersey near Wall Street. I had zero interest in that, Chris. It, I didn't like it. I, I didn't make sense. But real estate makes sense to me. The tangibility, the levers you could pull. And so, you know, 24 years ago, I just pulled the trigger on a fixer-upper, a three-family house in Longpoke, California. It's the best real estate class I ever took. People go, what's that best real estate class? 432 North M Street. I mean, by far best real estate class I'd ever taken. And that started the journey. And I was your classic buy, fix, and sell. I'd buy HUD foreclosures, fix them up, sell them to FHA buyers. And that was my niche. And then I started to buy old fixer-uppers, fix them up, and keep them as rentals. And then I started to get hired by uh, investors to do the same. This was in uh, California, northern uh, central California, for a number of years. By 2005, things weren't making sense out there. Not many places were they. And I thought, gosh, we got to get out of here. I want to go, you know, stay warm and by the water. And Florida was the next calling. And that was a really good move because I definitely suffered uh, in a lot of my California properties through 08. In fact, I almost went bankrupt in 08 when, when you know, values dropped 30 plus percent, rents dropped 30 plus percent. You know, you can have actually there's more, more like 30 to 40 percent on each of those. And uh, that was a big lesson to me of more is not better. And I got really serious. I was able to protect my investors, but not without a lot of sleepless nights and blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, but I found that I wanted to own better quality properties. I wanted to avoid something called the three-year curse. And for me, Chris, that meant if I you know, took an old house from the 50s and uh, I did a new roof, new heating and cool, new plumbing, updated kitchen, bath, electric, you know, by year three, all of a sudden, my maintenance repairs would start to go up substantially. And that no one ever showed you that on the performance. And, you know, doing hundreds of these, I'm going, dang. And, and my now building partner and I, who he came to me with this very simple idea. And he said, well, hey, why don't we build our own investment property instead of finding these old fixer-uppers that have so much competition and, you know, it's it's tough to see this three-year curse coming. What if we built our own? I thought, huh. Oh, I hated the idea. I was a rehabber. I mean, this was my life for 15 years, uh, but it's the best decision I ever made. And we did an experiment of about $3 million worth of real estate. We put in the development fees together. We built these properties and it went okay at best, but we could see the writing on the wall. And as we fine tuned it over this last decade, you know, last year we did nearly 200 million in sales. So you could see the scalability. 
we couldn't do this with the old houses. There's, you know, there's less headaches, less surprises, less maintenance repairs, less turnover, better resaleability and growth. And we were able to stack, you know, now talking with you today, we can say, look, we did a few thousand of the old properties. We did a few thousand of new construction. And there's no competition, not only in involvement and intensity, but also returns. So, Jim, I, I got to kind of tell you, and you know, I haven't talked to this audience a long time about this. You know, my first flip was in 2006. So, you know, I, I guess when you think back, you just forget how much time goes by. You know, it's not as much time as you've put in, but I remember that was my first flip. And from there, you know, I did a couple more. I was, in, I was a Wall Street guy. So I was a financial advisor and an, an ex-pro snowboarder. And um, I'll, I'll never forget, in 2008, I started developing. I developed a strip mall for my retail stores. I had skateboard snowboard shops. And I almost went bankrupt as well in 2008. And, but remember, I was, a, I was an advisor. I, I should have saw 2008 coming based on all the signals and the trends, but I, I didn't. I mean, I just was doing the, what the 99% do is just follow everybody else. And uh, that bankruptcy pivoted me and I started buying apartment buildings in 2009 to 14. And then I almost lost all of those in 14 because I did it all wrong, all the weight put on the banks. And then the bank just pulled the card out from underneath me and just said, hey, we're calling your line of credit. So I had to wow. spin off all those. But then me and my wife started flipping houses and we did that. That would have been about 2014. And we ended up flipping 274 houses before I realized it was just awful. I actually probably <laughs> realized it was awful, day one, but it took me 274 punches to the face to realize how terrible it was. But the <laughs> unique thing is, is I'll never forget during this whole thing, Jim, we knew this guy in my town and this guy, he was just a normal everyday guy actually worked at I can't, a Home Depot. He was a Home Depot guy. And he came to us. We always see him at this restaurant. He told us, he said, Hey, I'm going to start building duplexes. And I bought this land over on this. It wasn't even a great piece of land. And I'm like, you're going to do what? You're going to build duplexes and rent them? I'm like, why don't you just buy existing ones like we're doing? Because at that point, we'd started taking some of our flips that maybe weren't going to be profitable and converting them into rentals. You talk right. about that three-year curse. Dude, I had like a year and a half curse. I think our infrastructure. Because <laughs> you're absolutely right. You get them, they're cash flowing, and then everything goes wrong with them. The main sewers, and it's always big stuff. So this guy's building these duplexes. And, you know, I. I hadn't really thought about this man for a long time, but I know last time I checked on him, which is probably five years ago, I think he was well into the hundreds of these duplexes that he had built. And I'll never forget him saying kind of what you said. He did it because he knew if he built it from scratch, he wouldn't have maintenance for a period of about 10 years. Uh -huh. It just, it just brought me back to that. And, and there's so much relevance in that. I kind of wish I had just kind of opened my eyes a little bit more but i was like you i was just a fix and flip guy traditional you go find the deals you get really good at marketing and all of a sudden you're just off and and running and then you just get uh, sucked in thank god you found that and, and and now that's such a popular thing out there but you know i want to go into another thing just because this is all about money you did something unique and before we actually i'm sorry let me pause and let's transition so a lot's happened in the last couple of years, Jim. We, we've had the Fed, you know, go out. Well, we had the pandemic, which we all know what happened with that. You you may not. You were in Florida. So nothing happened there. I'm never we afraid. I was speaking spoiled. in Florida. Yeah. I'd show up. Nobody would have masks on. We'd be out to dinner. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> back to New York, and it's just like locked down. Uh, yeah. Yep. So maybe you didn't know, but. Uh, no, I did. That, I did. Oh. I did. I can see the, the the difference. That's for sure. Yeah, but they printed you know five point two trillion dollars. You know the good old Fed uh, and the government, and they distributed all that money, and they shut everything down, and they created this really unique dynamic, which you know led to this massive boom, but it also led to this massive inflation, which is yeah. of course what's going to happen. Contrary to the Fed saying, "Oh, it's transitory. Oh, maybe it's a problem. Oh, maybe it's not. Oh, it's a problem. We're going to handle it." But they jumped rates up you know, from zero to 5.2 to 5.5, that range. Right. And it's crushed a lot of real estate investors. It's yeah. hit them really hard, especially multifamily guys. Now Big let's time. just transition that back to your business model. How were you affected by the Fed? How were you affected by some of the pullback in pricing, more so on multi? And, and what is the game plan now? I know you did something in your business that I've never heard anybody do, but let's just, let's just hit that one on the head. Yeah, you know, Florida did help. I'm 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 going to say that flat out, Chris. We were very lucky to have the atmosphere we were in. Now we still had everything that 
we added more so here because there was such growth of the inflationary effect where supply chains got even worse here and the pricing was even worse here. So we had to battle through that. So there, with good comes bad. You know what I mean? There's the yin and yang. And we had to work through that. One of the most important things I think that did help us, though, Chris, was the fact that, you know, I've always been a residential guy. I didn't take that leap into apartment buildings like you did. And I, I remember a mentor of mine saying, look, you, you've done, you know, nearly a thousand houses now. You're just starting to get good at it. He's like, you could jump to that, but it's also not bad to keep doing volume where you were. And, and so me and my building partner stayed in that residential realm but we just expanded on it, meaning we didn't just do single family homes. We did like your friend did. We always offered a menu of single family duplexes and quads because then we could get the residential financing. Right. And and there's a huge difference when you go four and under to when you jump into the commercial. Massive world. difference. And that's so, what the problem is. Huge. I mean, I feel so bad for my apartment syndication buddies. You know, they're oh, getting these well, called in there and, and they did their. I, they were being responsible. They did their underwriting or assumptions, you know, like, yeah, we're going to lock in at, you know, 2% higher. And then when things went double that, when, we didn't see it that bad. I mean, we were still able to get financing, but the rates did go up. Not as bad as commercial, but they went up. But we said, we got to deal with this. So first of all, staying in that realm of just single family duplex and quads, we stayed in the residential realm. So it gave us a little bit of insulation, not total, but then we said, okay, rates have still gone up. And if we can't provide cash flow to our people, they're going away. You know, we 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 believe in positive cash flow. We like we we want to put ourselves under that that pressure and promise of we can build new construction, high growth areas, and get you cash flow right off the bat. And that worked really well for years, which a lot of people couldn't figure out how we were doing it, but we would do a menu of those three things. But then when rates jumped, you know, starting June 20. 2022, it was just crazy. We're all going, okay, it's going up. It's going up. It's going to stop. It's going to stop. Kept going. I mean, we hit 8% at the end of this year, of last year. So about a year ago, we got into the money buying business. So luckily, you know, we part of our company now is owned by a very large uh, builder and, and group out of Japan called Sumitomo. You hear about them on the news all the time. Warren Buffett's involved in one of their other conglomerates. And these guys have treated us really well. They give us autonomy to run the business. They provide all of our building funds. So we have no bank debt, which is pretty nice for a lot of builders listening. It's been a great position. And our balance sheet is very healthy now. And having a healthy balance sheet allows us to go to banks in a position and get these builder forward commitments, which just means we can buy money up front and it is expensive. But we are have always been a, a, a low margin, high volume builder. It was like the Walmart approach. We can build a really solid product. We'll make less off of each deal and make up for it in volume. And it's worked well. Well, this is the same thing now with, with, with doing this. And if a person went in off the streets, Chris, and said, hey, I want this rate. So right now we're locking our people in at about 4.75. Uh, that's a 10-year fixed, 30-year. Um, if you want to go 30-year fixed, you know, it's going to be about a half a point higher. But still, we're undercutting the market by about still, 3%. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's huge. But what we have to do, like if, if you and I walked in off the street and said to our mortgage lender, hey, I want to get 4.75. They'd be like, all right, uh, you're going to have to pay about eight to 10 points up front to get that. Now, we don't have to pay that much, but we're we're paying a healthy amount to get this money pre-bought. But again, we're passing this along to our people so we can get them the cash flow up front. Because honestly, our, our investors who, you know, we have nearly a thousand investors we're working with, they're busy professionals, they're looking for the long term, but they'd like to see some cash flow up front. And this makes all the difference. I mean, I don't have to tell you with your experience, you know, getting a duplex today, you know, $475,000 duplex in a great area of Florida today, if you're locking in at 7.75 or 4.75, it's night and day difference. It's, you, you, one is barely breaking even. The other is you're, you're doing all right. And then you just want to scale. Exactly. exactly. So, yeah. So that's been, that has kept us in a very solid flow of continuing to do a volume business. You know, I think new construction was key. Florida was key. Adding that part of not only offering single family homes, but duplexes and quads, which very few builders will do. And then the financing, you know, bringing in that financing, you can solve the financing issue for, you know, and that's I, looking back, Chris, that's what I've always done. You know, back in when I was in California and I was, selling, you know, HUD foreclosures completely renovated FHA buyers. Well, I would say, here's a good lender that you can go to. Hey, I'll pay your closing costs, you know, because they worry about how much down, how much a month. And 
that was a big solving issue. So I'd always try to solve the financing, never to this level. But for any investors out there, if you help solve their financing issue, you know, price is not their most important thing. It, it is really solving that financing issue. At least it has been in my career. Your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. No, you're absolutely right. And I mean, listen, you know, I've been in the money game for 20 years. You know, I, I consider myself one of the, I'm not going to say best, but one of the, the top money raisers in the space that we're in. And, and not only that, I'm the only one that's created the uh, dating site for money. Private lenders meet people that you know need money. And that's what I've created is the only private lending, true private lending community called Private Money Club. So the, the thing you said there, though, forget about money or houses or singles and quads. You mentioned something that I think everybody on this podcast needs to really take seriously. You mentioned that you solve a really big problem and you, mm -hmm. the financing is that really big problem, plus the new builds and the price point you're building them at. So think of if any of you want success like Jim. All you need to do is figure out a problem and solve it. And the problem is never easy to solve, which is why not everybody does it. But once you solve that problem, you make more money than you know what to do with. By solving the money problem, which is the number one problem in most all real estate investors' lives, you now just created literally just a cash flow machine that will never stop as long as you can control and supply the, the financing in that capacity. And, and you figured it out. Plus you got this big conglomerate, which I mean, most people listening to this should know it or look it up. And not only that, like I've studied Japanese culture and Japanese businessmen and women and, awesome. and it's it, the best there is. It's their culture, folks. It's their ethics because they, it's bar none. I mean, read the book, Shoe Dog, and you'll understand a lot about Japanese business and culture. And the fact that you're paired up with one of them, number one, well capitalized, but number two, they've treated you well because that's just their nature. So I think you've done a lot of things right, Jim. I really do. But, you know, what would be some advice? Because there's a lot of real estate investors. I know you know a lot of syndicators and so do I. Capital calls, freezing prefs. I mean, got all sorts of issues in that. But it also, that, you know, although scares some people away from that industry, it creates a massive opportunity. There's a lot of people with multifamily right now that are I'm going to say they're on life support and yeah. they're going to need to, they're going to need to make some moves here in the next year, definitely this year, depending on what happens. But uh, folks, you just need to be out there looking, you need to be pounding the pavement and multifamily might be a space I'd say you're bit early now, but 20, late 2024, 2025 might be a good time to start looking yeah. for bargain hunting, but might also be a good time to build a business like you have, Jim, where it's multifaceted. If somebody's going to go multi, also have a, have an arm that's single families. And, and I think the single family market. I had a guy on this podcast the other day who's all about the data. And I think it's fascinating how, how residential, we'll just call residential, residential, you know, one to four units has barely changed, even though rates have gone from zero to 5.2 to 5.5. It's insane. Actually, pricing has gone up about a percent in the last year, which oh. has been hard for everybody. I think it's phenomenal. You're in, in Florida, so you're even more insulated, but it's it's wild. And he he had all these charts and these things and he explained the relevance of why it was. I'm not going to get into it today because it's just a lot of numbers, but it was fascinating. And it changed my perspective of what I think is going to happen in the future with single families. And I do think we're going to see a pretty consistent uh, pricing on residential. So I think anybody that thinks that residential is going to fall off the face of the earth in terms of price, and many economists do, I think they're going to get that wrong. And they're going to get it wrong because the Fed's going to play this game where they're going to bring these rates down, which is going to open up you know, homes like you have to another five, maybe seven million people that today do not qualify for mortgages. And I think it's going to be a, a pretty interesting dynamic. What is your take on the next two years in real estate? Yeah. And everything you said, I agree with. And I think that people, you know, it, builders or not, not builders, but your, your syndicator friends, apartment friends, if they're listening, you got to be prepared to have some hard conversations and yeah. you might have to make some capital calls. You might have to, you know, you're having hard conversations 
Chris, and I'm sure you've it's it's pinnacle to, to survival to your reputation. Don't hide from them if you're in, you have to talk to your investors. You have to stay in touch with your investors. We had to when there was delays and material price increases two years ago. But if you'll have those hard conversations again, have solutions. Normally, as you said, look, the end of 2024, 2025 is not that far away for them. You know, you can make some progress. And I believe, again, I look into the commercial sum, I really focus on the residential because that's where I am. The thing that I learned of where we got into trouble, and it's all in the data, you can look this up on the Fed charts. Where we got into trouble in 07, 08 was inventory. There were areas, even here in Florida, that were completely overbuilt. There was there was there were the 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 uh, just amount of levels of inventory was ridiculous. It just it didn't match up. Today we're at we're an inverse of that. We we have we are still low on inventory, and you can't even keep up with the building right now. You know, before the pandemic even started, like Southwest Florida, where we build, they were three years according to the municipality report. They were three years behind on needed rental inventory, and then all of a sudden the pandemic happened, and that area was the fastest growing in the nation. So I always say, whatever area you're in, Chris, look at the inventory levels. I mean, that is supply and demand. And if, you, if they're still low inventory right now, and they're about to drop rates, which everyone said, I mean, it's an election year. People like to look good in election years. They're going to be dropping, dropping, dropping. And what is that going to do to the market, especially these small residential markets? Like if you own duplex and quads right now, or you're thinking about it, I'd buy them quick. Yeah. Just at the end of November... The, the I don't know if you even saw this. Fannie Mae came out with a new guideline. Yeah, they they that, revised their guidelines. They revised their numbers, and they said they're looking at 5.8 by the end of 2024, which to me, it blows my mind. Well, they're not only doing that. They're lowering the rates, and for an FHA buyer, for a while, they had raised it up for years. For for you and I, if we were first-time home buyers to buy a, 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 a duplex or a quad, you got to put 25% down. Now, that's a lot of money. They've dropped it to 5%. You know, I didn't hear that, but I didn't know that was actually solidified. Oh, I, I heard them cool. rumors. And now we have we have these new investors that live here, you know, and think about this. When you were you and I were just starting out years ago, you could buy a quad now and for five percent down and we pay the closing costs and and so they're really truly only coming in with five percent. They can live in one unit for free, rent the other three units. It's it's so we're getting these good old house hacking. Yeah, little house hackers coming in on duplexes and quads. I'm building one with my 20 year old son. It's his first property, you know. So it shows that this is a time to get in because this is going to continue to get more popular. They only approved it right around Thanksgiving. Then we had Christmas. Here we are still in January at the time. So I think that's going to be something to look for. For if if the commercial realm is not working for you, well, hey, a couple of duplexes and quads can add up pretty quickly. Pretty quick. You no, know, there's to to a small multi unit, and and you're not stuck in that commercial wheel of financing, which is a disaster right now. The residential realm still has some guardrails around. Yeah, there, and, and it's going to get worse. You're going to, you know, the tide is going down, and as the tide goes down, more of those those risky drivers start to pop up out of the muck under the water, oh. and you're starting to see that. And you're going to see a lot more folks. And yeah, you're right. That commercial world is in massive trouble. And there's study after study talking about the commercial debt cliff. And that's because all these commercial loans matured five, seven, and 10 years. We are literally, we're, we're hitting it, man. That's it. And and these people that, that have these loans, their, their, their expense on their debt service is going to double. It's not, they're not going to be well, able. Not, it's not going to work. Not, it's not going to work at all. Well, they're not going to renew it. They're not going to. They're not going to get a new loan. Yep. And even if they could, the assumption they did, like we said, is, you know, at least two percent lower than what they had expected. So it's. I feel for them. I feel for them. You know, it brings back my 07, 08 days, which were not fun. But if you have some hard conversations, you do the right thing. You can hang in there, um, because I do like, like you said, Chris. I think there's going to be tremendous opportunity in the commercial area as we work through this. Yeah, I agree. Well, Jim, I want to take, you know, as we kind of cruise through this episode, I want to hit one of the things that is most near and dear to me. And, and that is, you know, you haven't really talked about it, but you have, and that is giving, you know, folks, listen, you, you want success. I mean, understand universal laws. The more you give, the more you put out there to help other people solve their problems, the more that will come back to you over and over again. It, it can't, you cannot change that. And the funny thing is, is there's so many people out there that I see that are just me, 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 me. They only want to care about themselves. But 
I think a unique thing about yourself and, you know, I don't know how many people know this, but, you know, number one, you have five children, you know, you're a very passionate family man, but you also did something for your father that I find remarkable. Uh, I'm not saying that most, most, you know, children wouldn't do this for their parents, but you did it. And I think it's worthy of talking about. It is the ultimate gift. Can you just talk a little bit about what you did for your dad, which I would have to believe saved his life? Yeah, no, it was, so he got sick 12 years ago, stubborn little Irishman. And uh, he had years and years and years ago, Chris, he got, he, he got a weird form of strep throat. Luckily, the strand's not around. It creates something called Bright disease. So it's not hereditary, but he got this thing because, I don't know, I hate it. Have you ever had strep throat? I'm like, get me the antibiotics. Yeah. My only one was a tough little Irishman. And he was like, ah, screw it. I don't need him. Well, it got him really sick years and years later in life, and his kidneys started to fail. So it was literally survive maybe in the next two years on dialysis and it's a shitty form of life like your, your life quality sucks or get a kidney donation and i was like that's me so you know oldest son of the family i was like i can do this he fought it tooth and nail finally you know with some deep conversations i was like you know let me be the man you wanted me to be if you don't let me do this you realize that and so um yeah we we donated a kidney Chris, I got an extra 10 years with him. He died on Christmas two years ago. He fell. Blessing. He's never resolved. He fell. But an extra decade I got. Seriously. An adventure going back to Ireland together. My my wedding in uh, Costa Rica. Seeing more grandchildren born, you know, and no dialysis. You know what I mean? So he had quality of life. Um, so it's one of the best. And this, look, this is something where, where I talk about in my real estate talk. This is what real estate, it's not the real estate, it's what does it provide? You know, I was the only one in my family that had the ability, not only financial resource wise, but recovery wise to be able to to do this. And so, yeah, when people say, you know, what is real estate brought to you? I appreciate it. That was one of the most important. Like I could do that with the financial resource, with the recovery space. And I had an extra decade with them. You know, and 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 I'm healthy and recovered. It's it's amazing what the body does after it loses one thing and and grows. But yeah, one of the best things that ever come out of real estate, Chris, for me was what you just talked about. So I worship, man. I just love it. And you know, I I was fortunate. I got a chance to go to Ireland last year, first time in my life. What a beautiful country! Oh my goodness. But you're right. Like I got to meet a lot of the locals. So I'd go out at night and I'd just go to the local pubs and just kind of just hang out with the locals. And yes, oh, yeah. stubborn, stubborn men out there. I got to tell you, <laughs> very different than here in New York. But I loved every minute of it. Uh, I would go back in a heartbeat. I just thought it was a a beautiful place. Thought people were incredibly friendly. So uh, I just wanted to bring that up. But um, let's just talk a little bit about like kind of your next. You know, what what is your legacy? What is it that you're really passionate about that you're doing, you know, and I think some of it ties back to your book, the family board meeting, like, yeah. what would you say that is? What's your legacy? So the family board meeting is definitely one of my legacies. I, I, I mean, my wife and I wrote that book, not wanting to, we're pretty vulnerable in it, talking about our family story, but we had some sound principles that seem to be working and sharing those, you know, that was a book again, the first edition we released I mean, it was $800. My wife was breastfeeding while we're pressing the Amazon stuff to get it on there. And now the last time a publisher just picked it up, it went to number one on Wall Street Journal. So you never know. This wasn't, there was, wasn't this big goal of like, this is my, 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 my next business funnel of, of sales and strategy. It was like, hey, this is a simple family book and, uh, and it's done really well. And so I think I think making sure to be successful in business, but don't forget to be successful at home. That's kind of the legacy that we try to try to uh, really emphasize. And the family board meeting has been the, the 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 first step. And we actually have a new book coming out in a few months called the Passive Income Playbook, and that's going to combine more of our real estate journey with our kind of our family rhythms and and values and the outside the box thinking we did to raise our kids to be entrepreneurs and get important lessons not taught in school. And so that's my next project. That one's coming out in a few months, but that's really about uh, not only making sure you're successful in business and successful at home, but people are always like, well, tell us more about your real estate journey. I've never really shared our principles or, you know, even the success stories of people we've mentored or build around. And, and this book is kind of, kind of encompass it all into one. I love that. And folks, if any of you are interested in the books, we'll put the links to the in the description so you can grab a copy of that. I would urge you to do that. 
And, uh, you know, I, one other thing too, when we're on the topic of books, you know, that I'll just give every one of you some advice. You know, I, I know a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to write a book. And like you'd mentioned, I'm going to create a funnel and it's going to be the best sales magnet ever. And I'm going to make a ton of money. <laughs> Let me give you some advice about books. You'll lose money. You will not make money on book. It will be the best business card you've ever had. But if you write a book from your heart, and if you write a book with passion, without any expectations ever happening on the end, you just write it because you know you need to put your story out there, your book will fly. I am yeah. right now writing my sixth book. It will be a probably two-year write because I'm no rush, but it is very much my legacy. I did a TEDx talk called um, Rethink Money, which was a letter I wrote to my daughter all about money and the six laws of wealth told in parables. I'm taking that story and I'm, I'm converting it into a book called the, the working title. It might not stick is, is the, the big leap. And it's all about a father telling his daughter bedtime stories, but the bedtime stories, they're just me. They're told in third person, but they're actually stories of the father's failures and, and, and journey through life. But the daughter right. doesn't know this and it, and it forward paces through the father's life and the daughter's life. And later in life, like she starts to, pair up some of these stories that her dad's been saying in these bedtime stories and saying, you know, dad, I know that that story was about this other person, but like, didn't that happen to you? Mom said that happened to you. And she connects the dots. And the whole idea with the book at the end is basically, you know, like these leaps that the father took, which is my story, are, are oh. all basically kind of preparing her to take over the family's legacy, the family's trusts and foundations, which is is kind of what I've got it set up. And it's basically all down to the golden key at the end. And I, that that key gets handed to her because she masters all these lessons and these, these principles of life and how to live. And they're not what people think. They're not put money in a 401k and invest in the S&P 500. They're, they're far bigger, like giving and, you know, protect your wealth and don't be greedy and just the simple fundamental things that people need to know. And I, I don't care if I ever sell a copy of the book, as long as my daughter gets that copy. Yeah. That's, well, I'll buy a copy. Good. We'll have to, we'll have to invite you on our 18 Summers Family Podcast for that oh, one. That'd, that'd be awesome. Really good conversation. So now I love to hear that and you're hitting the nail on the head. So many people focus on the garnish and not the meat and potatoes. Yes. And we can spend our whole life like so many people, like my my father struggled with money his whole life. I loved him, but he, he he and he said, "Do something on your own." So he didn't know how to tell me how to get there, but he pointed me in the right direction. And I swore for my kids, like you just said, we could work our whole life not understanding how money works. But what if we teach them young how money works? Is there is their work life going to look different? I think will. so. No, it, there's no think it will. It, it and so I, I'm glad to hear you're hitting. The nail on the head, that's one of the most important subjects not taught in school, that as parents, if we don't share that, we we are we are not being great parents. There's just, no, you don't teach them about money, you are, you're putting them at a handicap. If you teach them about money, they actually, I feel, have an unfair advantage to live the life they want to live. It is. They, they have the advantage of the, the 1% or the 5%. I mean, because that's it. That's it. And it's not yeah. a big difference between the 5% and the 95%. The difference is creation versus conformity. Let that one sink in, folks. Creation is what the 5% did different. Creation is what the 1% did different. The other 99 or 95%, this mistake they made is they conformed to somebody's failed reality. And you should never do that. Chase your dreams, folks. Chase your goals. Don't let anyone stand in your way. Just go after it. You will fail and learn in those failures. Just like Jim talked about, we've all failed. Jim has failed. But he got himself back up, he dusted himself off, learned from what he did, and pushed on. But he also learned the ultimate gift, and that is giving. And folks, I think that's the big takeaway from today. Jim, this has been awesome. Where can people learn more about you, your business? And if people are just looking to buy some of these properties that you're building you know, for rental, how do they how do they get involved with you? Yeah, a, a great starting point is jjplaybook.com. That's going to be kind of my family's journey into real estate starting almost 24 years ago now. And that'll have the principles of, of our journey and also how Build to Rent works. If you're looking at getting involved with, you know, our nearly thousand person investor network buying with us right now, we'd love to work with you. And a copy, if you want, of the original book, The Family Board Meeting, you can find that at Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, anywhere. And our next book, Chris, I'll make sure the Passive Income Playbook, the link we give you, it'll give everyone in your community, the first three chapters for free. So at least they can, you know, get a feel of, of kind of the story behind the story. 
I love that. But let's let's pause that and let's just do another podcast when that book's ready. And we'll just do a podcast all about the book, the principles, and then we'll we'll give everybody three three chapters for free at the end of it. I think that's a great segue and a great way to wrap this episode. Sounds good, man. Well, I really appreciate the conversation today and love what you're doing with your daughter and also with, as I talked about, solving the financing issue. Hey, I have hard money to lend. I've got a project. I think that's great what you're doing. Awesome. Well, hey, folks, thanks for joining me and Jim today for this episode. Remember, check the description, jjplaybook.com. We'll also put the link for the book, the family board meeting, or just go go to your local Barnes & Noble, grab a copy while you're sipping on your Starbucks. With that being said, that's going to be a wrap for this episode of the Money School Podcast from myself and Mr. Lazy Cash, the star of the show. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining.